Good evening. I'm Harold Holzer, uh, director of Roosevelt House, and uh, on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, I want to welcome you to what promises to be, for our regulars, I'm sure you'll agree, yet another extraordinary program here at the House. Um, I want to go back. Uh, I, I usually begin by talking about Franklin Roosevelt. Let me spend my few minutes talking about Eleanor um, in this particular season when we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, with an exhibit upstairs in her mother-in-law's parlor, appropriately enough. I hope you will have a look at it during the reception period. Um, I want to go back for a minute to January 1941. Um, after Franklin had made a commitment to human rights crystallized in the four freedoms that are inscribed on our back wall, one of which inviolably everywhere in the world was, of course, freedom of speech. Um, and Eleanor made her own statements about freedom of speech uh, around this time of year in 1941, October 19th, right after her birthday, which was October 11th. Uh, she was on the radio. And she was asked about whether the government ought to crack down on the uh, anti-government, uh, pro-isolationist, vaguely or not so vaguely anti-Semitic rantings of people like Burton Wheeler and Gerald Nye and Charles Lindbergh, um, should they be silenced? And Eleanor said, I think it is permissible for them to present their views to the world, but I think it's equally permissible for all others. Why is one propaganda any different than any other? It is perfectly evident that allowing a citizen to say yes to the government is not freedom of speech. The real test is whether a citizen has the right to say no. And then she went on to quote Louis Brandeis, who had just died, um, that no danger from speech can be declared clear and present unless the incidence of the evil apprehended is so imminent that it may be dangerous. Uh, if there is free discussion, and she quoted that seamlessly. Uh, so Eleanor added, I would not curtail the expression of anyone's opinion. I just want to make sure that equal opportunity is given for all sides to be represented through every avenue of communication. I don't know if she anticipated Twitter, but she was pretty definitive. <laughs> freedom of one side, she said, is not true freedom. And then, of course, we know that she applied that strict application to the Universal Declaration, which I know our guest will speak today. Um, perhaps it's fitting that she will be signing books in what used to be Eleanor's dining room on one side of it, on the other, her mother-in-law's dining room, the room that her mother-in-law actually broke through to unite the houses that Eleanor believed would not be joined together, that she would have her privacy and individuality in this wedding gift from her mother-in-law. Um, you know, in a sense, uh, that, that renovation drove Eleanor out of this house in many ways and into a career of public service. Uh, so I guess we're grateful to Sarah for making her uncomfortable <laughs> enough to get into the world. Um, Nadine Strassen has told her story so well. She has fought herself for human rights and civil liberties for more than a quarter of a century, most notably as president of the ACLU, the first woman and the youngest person ever to head the organization. So we're privileged to welcome her to this cradle of free speech. She was born in Jersey City, I learned today, I didn't know that, the daughter of a Holocaust survivor and the descendant of an immigrant who became a World War I conscientious objector. Uh, how's that for a DNA that can only produce a civil liberties lawyer? She graduated from Harvard and Harvard Law School. Today she is a professor of law at the New York Law School, at New York Law School, a member of the National Youth Rights Association and a founding board member of Feminists for Free Expression. Her previous books include Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights, and Speaking of Race, um, hate speech, civil rights, and civil liberties. Um, speaking of uh, free expression, and 
my friend Bill gave me a great setup for this, and I've forgotten it, so I'll just tell you. When I looked up her previous books on Amazon today, I noticed that Defending Pornography was number 16 in books on women's rights and number 27 in pornography. Now, that is a remarkable <laughs> achievement. I will not tell you what's on the top 25, but she's number 27. Um, and now the book we have come to hear about, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. And um, Nadine Strassen will be interviewed by our own public programming curator, Bill Goldstein, who is uh, an author and editor in his own right. And if you read all the publishing newsletters, you may know that he is just signed to do a, um, an authorized biography of pioneering gay rights leader Larry Kramer. And having had my own things with Larry Kramer, good luck <laughs> on that. <laughs> I'll be glad to share my... Uh, Professor Strassen will um, speak with Bill about the book, and then Bill will lead and moderate a QA. and a um, When that begins, I will urge you all, I know you all have wonderful, booming voices, please wait for the microphones. Be patient, because we are not only recording this for our website, but we are broadcasting it on YouTube for students who are um, otherwise watching uh, while they study, presumably. So we do need you to wait for the mic. Uh, please, in the meantime, silence all of your devices, any devices that make any kind of noise. I beg you to, uh, to turn into silent mode. And now, as you do that, please join me in welcoming Bill Goldstein in discussion with our special guest, Nadine Strassen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harold, very much. Um, I appreciate that. And I noticed before I uh, begin speaking with Nadine that we are sitting across from the words freedom of speech and expression. The first of the four freedoms is freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. So I feel that we should, <laughs> we're in a good place for this conversation. Uh, before we begin, I just want to say how, how happy I am to be speaking with Nadine and also how happy I was to hear that Defending Pornography is still <laughs> on bestseller list because it's through that book or in, in beginning to work on that book that Nadine and I first met when I was an editor at Scribner. Uh, I guess my boss had freedom of speech too, and she used to leave me articles and notes on my chair before I would come in in the morning suggesting that I get in touch with various people uh, who might write books, and I always hated those. And um, <laughs> But uh, the morning that the New York Times reported that Nadine had been elected the president of the ACLU, the article which I had read at home was on my chair with a note, don't you think you should get in touch with this woman to, to write a book. And I thought, oh, the last thing she wants to do is hear from an editor. But I did get in touch, and it led to Defending Pornography, which began as a, as a law journal article that you wrote. And uh, after we had been in touch for a long time, I wrote to her and said, you sent me this. This is the making of a book. And, it, and, and I said yes with alacrity. And, it, and if I can say We so still had to negotiate a contract. <laughs> she wanted money, too. <laughs> Uh, but the two books are actually very, very similar because my bottom line in both books, contrary to a lot of assumptions and contentions today, is that we don't have to choose between freedom of speech, liberty on the one hand, and equality, safety, dignity on the other hand. It's been very fashionable to argue that there's some inherent conflict between civil liberties and civil rights. And I believe, based on actual experience, that they are mutually reinforcing that freedom of speech is the essential engine for every movement for equality and social justice, including women's rights and the movement today for racial justice and against misogyny and every other kind of discrimination and hatred. And that was the issue in the mid-'90s, I mean, that there were forces suggesting that pornography uh, was inherently dangerous to women and should be limited. So if you could talk about uh, the links between these issues in the sense of what seems like uh, 
possible limitations and why they are actually impossible limitations to place on speech. Okay, so there's kind of a, an instinctual reaction that if speech is hateful or demeaning or disparaging, and by the way, those are the same terms that were used in the anti-pornography laws that were propounded by uh, pro-censorship feminists such as Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin. The very same terms appear in hate speech laws. And I completely share the goals of people who want to censor speech that is disparaging, degrading, dehumanizing, namely the goals of equality, dignity, diversity, inclusivity, societal harmony, individual mental well-being. Uh, well I completely champion and fight for those goals, but I am absolutely convinced, based on experience with censorship laws, both around the world and in this country, before we had strong protection for free speech, that those who have the most to lose from any censorship regime are those who lack political power, who have traditionally been marginalized and excluded. We have a consistent pattern throughout history and around the world that these laws that are intended to benefit minority voices and minority groups actually disproportionately suppress our voices. So going back to uh, the pornography issue, when our adjacent country of Canada did approve a, what I, uh, I and my colleague, Marsha Pally, who's nicely here tonight, also feminist from free expression, called the McDworkinite feminists. Um, when their law was adopted in Canada and upheld by the Canadian Supreme Court, one of the very first books to be censored was Andrea Dworkin's own anti-pornography <laughs> book. Because like typical people who were denouncing it, she uses very vibrant examples of it. Uh, we actually had a very ironic example here in New York with the New York Civil Liberties Union. There was a group called Feminists Fighting Pornography. And uh, some of you may remember the strategy that uh, they would have these huge blown up posters of what they considered to be the most degrading, horrific images, the woman in a meat grinder sort of thing. And they, uh, one of the places where they had these displays was in Grand Central Station, um, sort of accosting commuters as they were rushing to uh, get their trains. And the purpose of showing these degrading images was, of course, not with the hope that people would <laughs> adopt those negative attitudes toward women and become more discriminatory or more likely to engage in violence, but for exactly the opposite purpose. Uh, nonetheless, the powers that be in Grand Central Station thought that this was offensive and disturbing to commuters, so they uh, censored uh, feminists fighting pornography, which immediately came to the New York Civil Liberties <laughs> Union asking us to defend their right to display pornography. Uh, and it, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's really not a laughing matter because I care so profoundly about all of the goals here. Uh, since I wrote my last book, uh, we've had a couple of decades of experience uh, with laws in other countries, other comparable countries that censor hate speech on the basis of race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, a very long list. And uh, first of all, there is not even any correlation between strict enforcement of these laws and suppression of hatred and even discriminatory conduct and violence. Uh, we have these serious problems in this country, but they are at least as serious, uh, if not much more so, in countries that actually enforce these laws. Well, I do want to talk about some of the examples, but I think because you make a very clear point that, that one of the most important things to understand about hate speech and the dangers of suppressing it is that there is really a lack of even a definition of what hate speech is. So can you talk about grappling with an issue at the heart of which is an undefined term. Exactly. So all the way through my book, I use quotation marks around the term hate speech, as do other people who comment on this issue, to underscore the fact that it is not 
a legal constitutional law term of art. The United States Supreme Court never has defined a category of speech by its hateful or hated content and said it is therefore excluded from First Amendment protection. It's distinguishable from obscenity, which is a constitutional law term of art that the Supreme Court has applied to a certain subcategory of sexual expression, and it's got a long, complicated definition. If speech satisfies that definition, the court says it is categorically unprotected. Now, I totally disagree with that conclusion, too, but that's uh, for the other book. So um, we tend to use the term, if you pay attention, you'll see that people use the term hate speech very promiscuously to describe anything that they hate. Uh, on college campuses in the period leading up to the uh, presidential election and, and thereafter, uh, just the word Trump on sidewalks or on caps or on t-shirts was considered to be hate speech. <laughs> on other campuses, the term free speech has been deemed to be hate speech. And to use one very pointed example to illustrate the notion that one person's hate speech is somebody else's cherished speech, Black Lives Matter advocacy has been attacked as hate speech. Uh, it even has been denounced as a hate crime in the wake of the assassination of Dallas police officers last summer. A number of government officials in Texas and elsewhere said Black Lives Matter advocacy uh, should be blamed and, and held culpable for these deaths. Uh, likewise, some other people, including some Black Lives Matter activists, have said that Blue Lives Matter <laughs> is hate speech, and All Lives Matter has been denounced as hate speech. It's an inherently subjective concept, which means that whoever has power to enforce the law, whether it be a government official, a university official, is exercising unfettered, unconstrained discretion. And it's not surprising, therefore, that that discretion over time is disproportionately used to silence government critics, those who are uh, challenging the status quo, those who are dissenting from government policies, those who are pushing to empower traditionally marginalized groups. So the danger is also, I mean, you were talking about the fact that Andrea Dworkin's book was, was, was uh, banned uh, in that larger sort of trawl of what, uh, what would be banned. And so you have, on the one hand, a government, uh, whether it's state, federal, local, uh, that might limit free speech, but then you also have the danger of just, I mean, what we see on Facebook or on other social media where rules, I mean, now that's obviously not government uh, sanctioned, uh, but things fall under these loose categories so that you know, maybe the Venus de Milo you know, is not allowed to be shown or you know, once, once it's taken down, then it's excluded. But, so you have, on the one hand, the forcible suppression of free speech that you're describing, but then you also have such a large category of things that might fall into this, that the dangers are in both ways, aren't they? I mean, that we fear government action, but also just you know, being able Ab to... Absolutely, focus. and um, my book is attempting to make a universal argument that's not uh, confined to First Amendment principles, and in that sense, it's wonderful that we're looking at what the universal declaration here that Eleanor Roosevelt played such a leading role in, in ensuring and uh, promoting the adoption and making sure, by the way, that the universal declaration would not include government power to censor hate speech. That was an idea that was pushed very hard by the Soviet Union. Yes, but, I mean, yeah. I was going to say, Ro Eleanor Roosevelt plays a cameo, unexpected cameo <laughs> role in this book. I mean, we might as well digress into that now, say oh. more about what, what she fought okay, against. Okay, and then I'll, I'll come back to the, to the larger point. But uh, she opposed the Soviet pressure to empower government to censor hate speech because she predicted completely accurately that it's such a vague and amorphous and manipulable power that it could be used by authoritarian government to suppress any kind of dissent 
including religious and political dissent. And that is, of course, exactly the way the Soviet Union, which did have anti-hate speech laws, exactly the way it enforced those laws. Uh, and also to suppress ethnic and religious minorities, including Jews. So by the way, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch, great international human rights organizations, have always opposed censoring hate speech in part by looking at how anti-hate speech laws have been enforced, not only in authoritarian and totalitarian countries, but also in comparable democratic countries to the United States. Not surprisingly, the power is used in a way that is uh, reinforcing of those who already have power and uh, undermining those who are challenging the power. And to go back to the point about, you know, this is a universal argument that I'm making as to why I, no government, whether or not it has a free speech guarantee, and no private sector powerful entity, such as social media, should enforce laws against or rules against hate speech because they do so much harm, not only to individual liberty and democracy, but also to the supposedly countervailing goals that are actually uh, intertwined goals of equality and dignity. So to use the social media as an example, uh, Facebook recently released, I think probably because ProPublica had received leaked copies of the guidelines that it enforces to, um, to uh, implement its own community standards against hate speech, and there are dozens and dozens of criteria and considerations, and they're confounding. The New York Times put a list together and kind of did a little quiz, a do-it-yourself quiz. Do you think this would be hate speech? Do you think that would be hate speech? And all my friends were flunking it. And of course, no two content enforcers at Facebook can agree with each other on any particular incident. But the pattern is the predictable one that we see on the part of governments, that it is uh, protesters of government abuses who are disproportionately being silenced. So for going back to 2014, there's been a very large coalition, 77 civil rights and civil liberties groups, including the ACLU, have persistently complained to Facebook, and I'm just using it as an example, right. the others do know better, uh, that it is disproportionately silencing Black Lives Matter protesters, others who protest abuses in the criminal justice system, pipeline protesters, women when it comes to enforcing the anti-nudity standards, it's women and feminists who are disproportionately suppressed. Um, Reveal did a, a, a really disturbing study in which it showed that the very same posts that were made by a white person or an African-American person protesting um, certain government abuses, um, the white uh, poster would be allowed to remain on Facebook, whereas the African-American one would be, would be suppressed. So some people actually use the term race book to refer to mm. Facebook. And, and I really don't mean unfairly to single it out. I mean, this is d part of a universal right. pattern. Well, one thing, I mean, we're, we're talking about hate speech, obviously. Um, that's what we're here to talk about. But the book itself is called Hate. It's not hate speech. So if you could talk about the importance of the title uh, and why you titled it Hate. Uh, to be really candid, the title uh, became cemented in my mind and the emphasis became somewhat changed uh, as a result of the November 2016 election and the campaign leading up to it because I was very disturbed about the prevalence of hate in rhetoric and in our political culture. And, uh, and when I say our, I don't mean only the United States. This is a problem around the world where we are seeing uh, political parties with expressly racist platforms getting disturbingly high percentage of the votes in country after country. I think the most recent example was Sweden, and then in the most recent regional elections in Germany and Bavaria, populist party did, you know, uh, with fascist or racist tendencies, did 
uh, not did, did did much better than it had done in the past. So I see this as a as a real problem. And although my book is very much of an anti censorship book, I don't think that's the emphasis. It's no coincidence that the only verb in the title is resist. And we have to resist hate, but the effective way to do it is not through censorship. It is through anti, is through uh, other non-censorial strategies, including anti-discrimination laws, including laws against hate crimes and biased crimes. And also, you know, as I discovered from my research, the record in other countries of hate speech laws was surprisingly negative, much more so than I had realized. I was very surprised at the number of human rights activists in Germany and France and Britain and Canada and all these countries that uh, are enforcing these laws very strictly, and from the United Nations and regional human rights organizations. And these are people who are not free speech advocates. They are human rights advocates. And from that perspective, they are all saying our laws do not work. They do more harm than good. We ought to move more in the direction of the United States. We're hardly nirvana <laughs> when it comes to these issues. But we have been making marked progress, uh, despite, or not, I would say not despite the absence of censorship, but because of it. Well, one of the most illuminating things are the series of examples you do give from, from overseas. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to give a couple of the most out, outrageous or counterproductive, really, based on the laws. But then I also want um, to be sure uh, that we have time to talk about uh, what is constitutionally protected and what is not, what the Supreme Court has done. There are other questions. So, because that was almost my favorite, one after the other of these heinous invasions of privacy, even. It's not only what's happening in the public yeah. sphere, but even in private communication. Oh, yeah. Well, since there, there's just a wealth of examples, and uh, I try to give examples that would appeal to everybody or disturb everybody regardless of what your ideology is you would say oh my goodness government should not have the power to censor that since you mentioned private uh, a lot of the laws expressly extend not only to one-on-one -on -one conversations in homes and people are really nasty re <laughs> reporting on each other um, but even in correspondence so let me take one example that is so so wrong for so many reasons uh, in Germany which has probably the strictest anti-hate speech laws in the world with the possible exception of some Middle Eastern countries and it has among other things an extremely broad definition of anti-Semitic speech, which extends even to criticism of particular policies of the Israeli government, um, and it extends to certain statements about the Holocaust. I mean, not nothing even as, certainly something as blatant as Holocaust denial, but it doesn't even have to be that blatant, making a controversial or controverted statement about Holocaust history. So one example was uh, one historian wrote a letter to yes. an old-fashioned letter, you know, an envelope and sealed to another historian, and the receiving historian took issue with something that was said about the Holocaust in the letter, reported to the authorities, and the first historian was prosecuted and convicted for hate speech. Uh, in a, what I assume is a fairly progressive audience, that's my assumption in most of Manhattan, uh, let me tell you that speech by and on behalf of progressive causes has been punished as hate speech. My favorite example here comes from France, which along with Germany is right at the top of having extremely strict and strictly enforced hate speech laws. My husband has commented that's because France feels so embarrassed about its role in World War II, but putting that <laughs> aside. Um, so last year, the head of an LGBT rights organization in Paris, the ACT UP chapter in Paris, was criminally prosecuted and convicted for hate speech. Why? Because she used the term homophobe to describe the head of an anti-marriage equality group, and that was considered hate speech on the basis of beliefs. 
and a lot of these countries include that. So even you know what we would consider classic political speech, advocacy on behalf of equal rights, is ironically punishable as hate speech. Now, fortunately, she was not imprisoned, which she could have been under the law, but she was forced to pay a fine of um, $3,500, which is not chump change for a, an activist. Well, so Harold uh, talked about uh, Brandeis in, the, in his introduction, and if you could say something now that we've talked about the dangers, what, does, what, has, what have courts and what has the Supreme Court said and done in particular recently uh, about the issue of hate speech in, in quotes. So the U.S. Supreme Court, as I said, has never recognized a category of hate speech that is categorically unprotected. To the contrary, the court consistently, going back to uh, the middle of the last century, has strongly protected what it is called the bedrock principle of our free speech jurisprudence. Lawyers call it content neutrality or viewpoint neutrality, that government must remain neutral with respect to the content, viewpoint, message, or idea of speech. The mere fact that it's unpopular, even hated, despised, feared, uh, by even the vast majority of us or government officials is never a justification for suppressing it. If we hate the idea, we have to fight it with our own ideas. And Brandeis first uh, voiced those, uh, uh, that notion in a dissenting opinion that became the majority opinion, not coincidentally, in 1969. And it's not coincidentally because the robust protection of free speech, including for hateful and hated speech uh, was forged in the crucible of the civil rights movement because the advocacy by Martin Luther King and other civil rights demonstrators was seen as being hateful and hated and dangerous and subversive and offensive uh, to the communities in which they were, were, were demonstrating. Uh, since then, the so the most recent case that the Supreme Court decided on this issue was decided just one year ago. It was unanimous, and this is really important for a court that is so fragmented on so many issues. I cannot think of a single justice who has dissented from this position since 1969, uh, and that decision was unanimous as well. So last year, the Supreme Court had a case called Mattel versus Tam. Uh, which involved, we have certain hate speech laws that somehow get smuggled into statutes. So, you know, just the way uh, flag burning laws were enforced, were existed all over the country, and uh, finally the Supreme Court had a chance to strike them down. So, Simon Tam is an Asian American rock musician. I got to meet him yesterday. We spoke together at the same event. Uh, very gifted, and he is on a crusade uh, to use music to combat hatred and to promote human rights, and in particular, to promote the dignity and equality and to counter stereotypes with respect to Asian Americans, which is what he is. So all of his other band members are also Asian American, and they deliberately chose, as the name of their band, a term that has traditionally been an ethnic slur against Asian Americans, namely the slants. It turns out that buried in the US patent and trademark statutes is a hate speech law that says our government will not give trademark protection to a term that is disparaging or dehumanizing on the basis of ethnicity, among other things. When the US Supreme Court unanimously struck down that hate speech law, it was simultaneously affirming the free speech rights of Simon and his band, and also their equality and their dignity and their ability to uh, affirm their sense of pride in their ethnic heritage to reclaim that term. Well, can we say, but before we go to questions uh, from the audience, I mean, something about what is happening, well, there are two things I want to, if you could talk about the link between the Skokie case, the ACLU Skokie case in 1977, and what happened in Charlottesville, um, and then also 
what is happening on campuses, since we are on a college campus. If you could talk about those two things and maybe That's three even things. link them. <laughs> well, the two issues, Skokie and Charlottesville and, and college campuses, you know, although and they are all you can make them one, I bet. <laughs> they are, I was going to say, they are all linked by uh, something that we talked about earlier, which is the instinctual reaction to silence ideas that we hate. Nat Hantoff, the wonderful journalist and uh, jazz critic, said it very well in the title of a book that he published a couple of decades ago called Freedom of Speech for Me, but Not for Thee, how the left and right relentlessly censor each other. Skokie, I think, is the paradigm case that illustrates uh, this viewpoint neutrality principle, freedom even for the thought that we hate, as Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said. And what was particularly dramatic about it was that the ACLU, which has been in the forefront from the beginning, we're almost 100 years old now, of opposing hatred and promoting equality, working hand in hand with the NAACP from our beginning to counter uh, what white supremacists and Nazis stood for. Uh, and we defend all fundamental freedoms for all people, including freedom of speech for these Nazis in Skokie. As we pointed out in our brief, the arguments, oh, and I should say, Skokie, Illinois, a very important um, in 1977, when the case began, had a large Jewish population, many of whom were Holocaust survivors. One out of every six people living in Skokie at the time was either a Holocaust survivor or very closely related, you know, a, a nuclear family member. And so when today when people, and the case was a slam dunk winner in the courts of law, right, because it's this bedrock principle of viewpoint neutrality, it went all the way up the state court system, all the way up the federal court system to the US Supreme Court, and with one exception, an elected judge at a local level in the state court system who voted the wrong way, every single other judge uh, voted to uphold the free speech rights. That was very ho-hum. But in the court of public opinion, it was extremely controversial. The way it was extremely controversial for the ACLU in 2017 to come to the defense of the free speech rights of the neo-Nazis in Charlottesville. The way on campus to defend free speech for ideas that are unpopular there is extremely uh, controversial. And to give a very pointed example, when my ACLU colleague, the executive director of the ACLU of Virginia, sought to speak at her alma mater, the College of William and Mary, last fall on the subject of rights of college students to protest. She was subject to a disruptive protest that made it literally impossible for her to be heard above their bullhorns. And they were demonstrating with signs that said, liberalism is white supremacy. A public opinion survey was done by Pew, um, I believe it was done for the Cato Institute last year, which showed that a disturbingly high number of people for certain sectors of the population, a majority, said that it is as to defend free speech for racists is as bad as being a racist yourself. So these are the issues that run all the way through all of these incidents. And when I hear that today's college students are snowflakes or coddled or they're you know, especially uh, supportive of censorship, yes, I think too many of them are too supportive of censorship. I have to persuade them that that will undermine the social justice causes that I'm so thrilled that they are uh, advocating for. But they are no different, Billy, from the adults, you know, long past college age, who were ACLU members in 1977. Those card-carrying ACLU members who were such diehard free speech absolutists, in the wake of the Skokie case, 15% of ACLU members resigned 
over our handling of that case. So it's a universal issue, and part of the reason why I wrote my book was to try to explain to my fellow lovers of equality and my fellow haters of fascism why counterintuitively censorship is not a good strategy. Well, uh, one point to make is Thank you. <laughs> about Skokie, and you make it in the book, is that one of the long-term results of what happened in Skokie is a Holocaust memorial center. So it, if you could... It's such poetic justice that uh, many of the Holocaust survivors in Skokie were uh, typical, as was mentioned in Harold's wonderful introduction. My father is a Holocaust survivor, and he was very typical in not wanting to talk about it, not wanting to acknowledge it. And that was true for many of the people in Skokie. And as a result of this controversy, uh, they resolved that we have to discuss this. We have to educate about this. Uh, the problem is not going to go away. We can't bury it. Or burying, trying to bury it can actually do more harm than good, psychically and politically. Uh, and so they raised money for a wonderful Holocaust Museum and Education Center. Well, on that note, we'll go to questions. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you. Uh, hands. Uh, there's a Thank mic you. coming around. Please remember to use the microphone. Oh. Oh, you? I mean, in the front row? Oh, oh, I thought, uh, I'm sorry, I was looking at the cameraman. You know, I'm so technically adept, you know. It's like, get smart, there's a <laughs> microphone in the camera. Thank you, thank you both for doing this. Nadine, it's Chris from Aspen. Do you oh, remember? hi, nice how to nice see you. see you again. Thank you. Um, so the question I've got is, it has to do with the way language is used. Mm -hmm. There seems to be an idea that's kind of uh, bubbled up about language is somehow a violent thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's somehow equivalent mm -hmm. in the use of this person or that person to mm -hmm. physical violence, mm -hmm. which seems like kind of a nutty idea to me, but I would love to hear you talk about that. And some bit. people would say that's hate speech. You got to watch it, Chris. <laughs> um, seriously, I mean, I, I, joking aside, the uh, faculty members are really walking, and students too, walking on eggshells. You know, anything that makes any person uncomfortable um, has been treated as hate speech. But, and, and so you're absolutely right. The rhetoric is people say that speech is assaulting me. Uh, and they make no distinction at all between verbal conduct and other conduct. And, and I, it was, I really had to grapple with that. I hadn't, so there was something very good about those challenges, as John Stuart Mill told us, when you ha are forced to re-examine even tried and true principles, you have a new insight. So I was actually living that out, and I had to explain to myself for the first time, why is there a distinction? Why does the First Amendment give special protection? Why does the Universal Declaration of Human Rights give special protection to what after all, is a form of conduct. Burning a flag is expression. Wearing an arm, I saw Mary Beth Tinker yesterday too, wearing an armband is expression. You know, ha having a uh, placard and marching is, is expression. And there are, I concluded, um, and echoing a lot of other people who have thought about this issue, Chris, that there are two distinctions between expressive conduct and other conduct that warrant more protection for the former. Um, the first is the unusual importance of it, as signaled here and as has been reaffirmed in countries all over the world. Uh, expression is an essential prerequisite for everything else, for every form of advocacy, for every form of thought and, and consciousness and belief. Um, and and fighting for every possible cause. So it's un and 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 then there's also you know self government. The Supreme Court said that speech about political matters <coughs> is more than speech. It is the essence of self government, where we the people are sovereign. How can we exercise our sovereign power and hold accountable those we elect uh, unless we have the most robust freedom of speech? But also, there's a second part, Eleanor Roosevelt comes into the second part of the equation, which is that 
expressive conduct also is not as harmful as directly as other conduct. So that old statement, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, obviously that is not factually true. Words hurt us all the time, including hate speech. But it's a normative statement that we should not allow words to hurt us, right? That's when our parents told us that, when we were crying because of something somebody said and our mothers and fathers were saying, don't let them wound you. And that's where Eleanor Roosevelt is quoted in one of the epigrams to my book. She said, nobody can make you feel inferior without your consent. And I do quote both Barack and Michelle Obama and a whole lot of civil rights activists and minority group leaders who make that point because I don't want to come across as saying, well, I'm blaming the victim if somebody does allow themselves to feel disparaged by hate speech. But uh, in addition to the political experts who say that, there are psychological experts who say all of us can learn resiliency to not allow the words to have much less than assaultive impact, but um, any, any even insulting impact. So that's a distinction between an actual assault and a verbal assault. Everybody's always so surprised when you call on them. <laughs> oh, the mic. No, no. Don't begin. Excuse me. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm wondering about the the, the differentiation between uh, hate speech the old proverbial is fire in the theater. Mm -hmm. But the more violent it might be in a march, in a rally, mm -hmm. might be placards, mm -hmm. and they are shouting and saying whether it's hate, hate blacks, hate Jews, mm -hmm. kill, kill them all. The, the, the resulting violence that then occurs mm -hmm. afterward, mm -hmm. so that it's not just words. Mm -hmm. It's not just verbal, mm -hmm. but there are actual actions and ramifications and deaths and violent attacks that actually are provoked by the hate, by the speech itself. It's not just Yes, you have Simple. a section on the incitement to yeah. violence. So this is really a fantastic question, and you give me a chance to talk about the Second fundamental free speech principle, uh, the first one is the content neutrality principle, which is never a justification, that just disagreement with the content is never a lot enough to justify censoring it. The second principle is often called the emergency principle when speech in a particular context directly causes certain specific imminent serious harm. And one example of that is intentional incitement to imminent violence when the violence is likely to happen imminently. But the Supreme Court in modern history has insisted on a very tight and direct causal connection between the speech and the harm. Um, and, and before that, it used a much looser standard, which was called the bad tendency test. Any speech that might indirectly at some point in the future lead to harm could be censored, and it was under that looser standard that the civil rights demonstrators were uh, imprisoned. Martin Luther King writing his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. It was under that looser standard that women's rights advocates, including Emma Goldman and Margaret Sanger, were imprisoned, that anti-war activists were imprisoned, that uh, people who taught classic works of Marxist literature, professors, were imprisoned because that might lead people to adopt those ideas, which might lead them to join the Communist Party, and that might lead to the violent overthrow of the United States government. Uh, I, I was looking for the um, first uh, epigram I have in my book, which is by a Harvard Law School professor, Zechariah 
Chafee in the first half of the 20th century was the first free speech, serious free speech scholar in this country. And what he said way back then is still true now. He said, the real issue in every free speech controversy is this, whether the state can punish all words which have some tendency, however remote, to bring about harm or only words which directly incite to harm. So what you're, what you're saying is that in the moment, it's not possible or we should not limit what people are allowed to say because it's only the consequences that would then be legally well, it's a know, demand, dealt with. It's a demanding test, but it can be satisfied. And mm -hmm. if I could, since we have talked about Charlottesville, I'll give um, one other example. In addition to intentional incitement of imminent violence, which is likely to happen, another example of speech that satisfies the emergency test is a true threat. When the speaker is focusing on a particular person or small group of people, and I say this deliberately because we hear, again, the way we hear the word assault used rather loosely, Chris, uh, we often hear the word, I feel threatened by the fact that Milo is going to be speaking on my campus. But a punishable true threat is targeted at a specific group of people, and the speaker means to instill a reasonable fear that they're going to be subject to harm. And it doesn't matter that whether or not the speaker intends to carry out the harm, the mere fact that you reasonably fear the harm already interferes with your freedom and your, and your own free speech rights. So in Charlottesville, where those neo-Nazis were chanting, you will not replace us, Jews will not replace us, odious speech, but that was not a justification for suppressing them. However, when they say that, or for that matter, don't say anything, but are marching, brandishing lighted torches and brandishing firearms, that is a true threat. I would not go there and exercise my free speech rights or my rights to be in public. So it's a, it's a tough test, but it can, unfortunately, be satisfied. About a year or two ago, Heather McDonald, author of The War on Cops, went out to the West Coast, spoke at a college campus. This wasn't just a protest. They, they shut this presentation down before it even started. She had to be locked up in a campus office until the police could arrive to rescue her and get her off the campus. My question is, how do we turn something, something like this around when you have, as it was suggested, faculty and administration members that supported this outrageous behavior. And that, I'm very familiar with that example, and Heather and I have spoken together at campus free speech conferences. Uh, you know, one such incident is too many. On the other hand, we hear the same incidents described and, and justifiably complained about over and over. Heather at I think it was Pomona or Claremont McKenna, one of those colleges. Um, and then we hear about um, Charles Murray at Middlebury, and we hear about Ann Coulter at Berkeley. And you can count on the fingers of one hand, I think, really, those incidents. Still, I, I don't want to be, so, you know, they're, they're terrible. And as I said, even one speaker shut down or silenced is, is too many. But I think it is telling. Uh, that there are not more such reports. And I can tell you that there are many instances where Heather and Charles Murray and Richard Spencer and Steve Bannon the, and even Milo Yiannopoulos, Ben Shapiro, all the provocateurs have spoken on many campuses that you have never heard about because nobody tried to silence them. And so it shows that you know, protecting free speech is actually consistent with not amplifying the message of the hate monger. Unintentionally, people draw more attention to it by t trying to silence it. I'm also here to report that you know, I speak on three or four college campuses a week, no exaggeration, and I'm in touch with a very large number of students and faculty members and organizations. Um, the pendulum is definitely being pushed back in favor of free speech on campuses, in favor of open inquiry, civil discourse. There is a genuine hunger for it 
on the part of students and faculty members and alumni and trustees and donors. New organizations have been founded that are dedicated to these causes. New resources are being poured in to these causes from foundations across the ideological spectrum. Congress and state legislatures have taken note. Uh, I personally oppose legislation, uh, but I think it's, it's important that there be hearings and that government officials use their bully pulpit to call attention to these problems. Speaking of across the political spectrum, uh, I don't think you'll find too many books that have a quote by Cornell West right for, uh, next to one from Senator Lamar Alexander. Um, uh, we have time for two more questions. Um, this gentleman and then over here. Yeah. Hi. It's uh, funny that you mentioned uh, the campus example there because um, I'm studying library and information science and one of the questions that I got for this week's assignment is, uh, you know, a, a librarian gets a request from a student for uh, books that deny the Holocaust. She's uncomfortable about it. Uh, are there legitimate uh, limits and larger responsibilities to certain type of reference questions? And it, this sparked a, and a, a discussion in class that I, I swear 70% of the kids were saying, no, we, we have to deny, uh, you know, we, we cannot uh, give space to people who are, uh, who are hate mongers and who, you know, and who could do harm to others, so on and so forth. So anyway. I, well, I won't have his exact words, but I have a quote in here from Noam Chomsky, with whom I, I also shared a podium recently. So you, everybody's speaking about these issues on campuses all over the country. Uh, and Noam Chomsky, great progressive intellectual and activist who's been subject to censorship many times throughout his life, um, said, and this is a paraphrase, he said, it is a bizarre way to honor the memory of Holocaust victims by uh, uh, enforcing a major tenet of their oppressors, right? So, uh, uh, you know, of all the people to enforce censorship, it should not be those, it should not be done in the name of um, victims of, of repression of everything, including free speech. And truly, you know, there are surveys that show, to me, a disturbing ignorance about basic facts about the Holocaust. And I think the be in this country and elsewhere, I think the best way to counter that ignorance is to, or a very effective way, is to have people actually grapple with the facts and hear the arguments and marshal counter facts and counter arguments. It was a point that uh, John Stuart Mill made in that great essay on liberty, which I periodically reread and really stands the test of time. And it's really true that if you just accept something rotely because it's the accepted doctrine and dogma, you, it doesn't resonate with you as much. You're not forced to engage with it, to think about it, to relate to it. But when you go through the purpose of examining it because somebody else is challenging it, well, you first of all, you might actually reject or modify what had been an orthodoxy. But even if you don't, you will appreciate it with renewed depth and, and, and vibrancy. Well, also, I mean, you made me think now, but also while I was reading the book uh, about Skokie and Charlottesville, and I guess this case too, that you don't make the hate go away by hiding it, so. Exactly. Um, yeah. One more question. Oh, over here, here. Since I, oh, the, no, oh, well, now she's gone to the other. Okay, well, I guess two more since, two more, yeah. since this was to be the last Thank one. Thank you. Um, I want to bring you back to social media for a moment. I, I read those Facebook guidelines, and they struck me as kind of an unmanageable dog's breakfast of this and that. Um, but I, I wonder how the notion of um, more speech being the antidote mm -hmm. to bad speech can or does work on social media, mm -hmm. on, on the Internet, Particularly, at, at, I guess the question is, it, is the internet different? Is social media different? Mm -hmm. And particularly in light of the fact that, um, you know, if I s start to look for Holocaust denial, I will get more stuff on mm -hmm. Holocaust denial. And, and given the, you know, the, the, just the degree to which information um, is dispensed on, on the internet and by algorithm, does it present some kinds of challenges um, to which 
there has to be an answer either other than or in addition to the antidote for bad speech is more speech. I think uh, certainly I'd be welcome to or open to an additional suggestion, but the more speech approach has actually been very effective online. And one of the things that I, I remember when the internet was very new, I spoke at the Anti-Defamation League was having a, a program at the very, they and the Simon Wiesenthal Center at the very beginning had uh, of the internet was um, somehow linking every time somebody was looking for a Holocaust denial site, they somehow had rigged it so they would also get rooted too both the ADL and Simon Wiesenthal Center. So there are ways that that can be done. And to their credit, the social media companies have been um, financing scholarly studies about how can we harness the unique capabilities of this medium for good. And um, there are, are one of the, Twitter has done a study uh, on what kind of counter speech is, this, and Facebook also, what kind of counter speech is especially effective in social media. Uh, and there are people who literally will go online specifically to single out, you know, to try to reach hate mongers and to engage with them in these protracted dialogues that have led to. Um, re recruiting and redeeming former hate mongers. And then there are uh, Twitter mobs that gather to uh, counter hate speech. And uh, I, I describe some of the examples in the book, but it's a, also a growing specialty. It's a new field, and I'm very optimistic about it. I mean, each medium, can, it's only a medium. It transmits what we human beings transmit for good or for ill. And um, I, I'm very encouraged about the positive aspect. Last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a really nice presentation. Thank um, you for nodding along. Yeah. I like that. Well, As I'm opposed been, to nodding off. I've been, a, I've been a fan of yours for many, many years, and you're a hero to me. Thank so you. thank you. Um, I would like to marry the social media concept with the academic freedom mm -hmm. campus concept. And you didn't talk that much about, or if at all, about the government as an employer. Mm -hmm. And what I see as a disturbing trend, perhaps, where people are doing things in their private capacity, and they're employed by the government, and there are repercussions. Yeah. Would you comment on that? And, and there are actually have been repercussions in the pri for private sector employers, employees as well. And I'm concerned about that, too because my concern is re preserving robust free speech, even for controversial and unpopular ideas. And the coercive power of the mob uh, can be as impactful in suppressing speech as the coercive power of government. And this is a very difficult question for me. And I think for advocates of free speech and equality in general, in the sense that we are advocating counter speech, i.e. using our free speech rights to denounce and criticize ideas that we disagree with. But at some point, the counter speech can itself become so coercive. Uh, a friend and colleague in, in these efforts, Suzanne Nossel, who's the head of Penn, the literary and free speech organization, had a terrific op-ed in the Washington Post about this a month or two ago. Uh, and the, the headline of it really says it all. When is there too much counter speech? And she was talking about incidents which have continued of speech becoming harassing and humiliating and shaming such that not only are you threatened with losing your job and actually losing your job, uh, but you can't go out to a restaurant or you can't walk on the sidewalk. You can't lead your life in many ways. And uh, she tries to draw a conceptual line, which is the same that John Stuart Mill, by the way, on liberty, that whole essay is focused completely on private sector social pressure. He's not discussing government censorship at all. 
He says he thinks the greatest danger to freedom of thought and individual liberty is peer pressure, interestingly enough. And basically, he and Suzanne echoes this, say, we, in concept, um, what we're defending is the right to persuade, to educate. So if it crosses the line from that to just bullying and pressure and humiliation, that goes too far. But obviously, reasonable people will disagree about where that line is in a particular situation. Well, thank you, Nadine. I mean, we'll, we're going to have a reception and book signing, and if you buy a copy of the book, then you have the right to ask Nadine another question. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.